Welcome back, everybody. My name is Lewis. My name is Naomi. And today we're actually going to go over the case of Thomas Ince and the murder at Sam's Man, even though not really because it wasn't on Sam's Man, but it was related to William Randolph Hearst. Exactly. And that that's where my fascination comes in, maybe with my appreciation for cinema. Absolutely. So, um, on November 16th, nine, I'm sorry, 1880, John and Emma Ince welcomed their middle son to the world, Thomas Harper Ince. They're, they were an immigrant couple living in Newport, Rhode Island at the time. When Thomas was seven, the family relocated to Manhattan to pursue work in the theater. His father was both an aspiring actor and musical agent. The rest of the family, including Thomas, worked as actors during that time. It was at age 15 that Thomas made his Broadway theatrical debut with a small role in Shores Acres. He worked in a few other stock productions as a child and later worked as an office boy for theatrical manager Daniel Frothman. Thomas wanted more, however, and went on the ultimately unsuccess to be in an ultimately unsuccessful vaudeville group, Thomas H. Ince and his comedians in New Jersey. This venture did not last long, however. In 1907, when Thomas was 27 years old, he met a young woman and fellow actor named Eleanor Kershaw, but she went by the nickname Nell. They quickly fell in love and were married before the year ended. During their marriage, they went on to have three children together. In 1910, a chance encounter in New York City with a former employee from his old acting troupe changed the course of Thomas Ince's life forever. The former employee, William S. Hart, provided Ince with a connection to get his first work in a, in an action like in a film. A film action for a Biograph Company. The, the movie was being filmed by famed director D.W. Griffith. I'm like stroking out, not able to say that sentence. <laughs> I know, right? I think it was film actor, not action. I think that's what it is. Probably. Uh, Griffith, Griffith was so impressed with the young ints that he made him a production coordinator for Biograph. It was this position that led Ince's first work as a director. During his time of Biograph, Ince began began to coordinate projects at Coral Le LeMay's Independent Motion Picture Company, otherwise known as IMP. During this time during this time there, IMP was unable to complete the work on a smaller film and Ince saw his opportunities. He suggested to the owners of IMP that he be hired on as a full time director to complete the project for them. Ince's work was so impressive that IMP sent him to Cuba, Cuba to make one reel um, films with stars Mary Pickford and Owen Moore. This was due to IMP trying to avoid being overtaken by Thomas Edison's Motion Pictures Patents Company, the trust that was attempting to put all independent movie production companies out of business. Ince made a small impact with this project and continued to work on a variety of other projects in all types of subject matters, but he found himself particularly drawn to Westerns and American Civil War dramas. It was during this time that the clash between independent and trust films became much more heated in New York, so Ince left to pursue his dreams in Hollywood. Ince, who always had an eye for the larger picture, quit working for IMP and approached the New York Motion Picture Company, and YMP, in 1911. They had recently opened a West Coast facility named Bison Studios in what was then Edendale. The company wanted to use this facility to make westerns, and Ince was eager to spearhead directing those pictures. And ironically, actually, Edendale is where the, the Manson murders occurred. Exactly. It was actually the ranch that, that where the, everything actually happened. And also on top of that, uh, the Thomas Edison uh, motion picture the patents company was actually completely the reason why um, the Hollywood studio system actually went off to the West Coast rather than staying on the East Coast mm -hmm. because nobody could compete with that massive conglomerate that it was. So they decided to rebrand and completely start fresh. Well, it's hard to imagine a time when Hollywood wasn't the epicenter of movie making that it is now. Exactly. But it used to be New York and it was all in New York. And if you wanted to make it in that industry, 
that's where you started. So and Biograph was actually one of the first. Um, Biograph was a major player yeah. back then. It got a lot of people started, but exactly. Um, Biograph was actually the first major company that was used as a template across the blueprints for all major studios moving forward. So back on track, though. Yep. According to Ince, he was shocked when they agreed. The offer came as a uh, distinct shock, but I kept cool and concealed my excitement. I tried to convey the impression that he would have to raise the ante to to try f if he wanted me. That also worked, and I signed a contract for three months at $150 a week. Very soon after that, with Miss Ince, my cameraman, property man, and Ethel Brandel, Brandon? Brandon. My lead woman, I turned my face westward. Which is really cool because this is the studio system that hiring them at a certain dollar amount per week, which is very different than now where it's project to project and you're not tied to a studio. They were under contract to a specific studio, so this was a huge... Yeah. Especially it, back then, 150 a week would have been big. Yeah. So, anyway. Ince moved his family and a small entourage to California and began working right away. When he arrived, the studio was only a tract of land with a four-room bungalow and a barn. Always ambitious, and soon left Edendale to find an area that gave him more variety, and he soon purchased a 460 tract of land, acre tract of land called Bison Ranch, located at Sunset Boulevard and Pacific Coast Highway in the Santa Monica Mountains. By 1912, he purchased the ranch and received permission from NYMP, to lease an additional 18,000 acres in the Palisades Highlands, which stretched over 7.5 miles up to an area where Universal Studios would eventually be established. It was here that Ince built his first studio. This studio was the first of its kind and was nicknamed Inceville by the NYMP owners. It featured silent stages, production offices, printing labs, a commissionary to support hundreds of workers dressing rooms, props, houses, elaborate sets, and all other necessities in one location. It is difficult to imagine Hollywood in its infancy, but at one time this concept of housing everything in one spot was revolutionary and could be attributed to Ince's ingenuity. He really was a forerunner of his time in establishing what Hollywood was, and the studio was completely unknown and foreign exactly and i think Hollywood he system. grabbed a lot of the the institutions that biograph wanted to really put in place and they didn't have the funding for because dw griffith was known for his major productions and he plays a huge role in this later on in Ince's life yeah so and this is one of those unsung heroes of hollywood i think he, he, really he, he fell into obscurity but he really was such a major player in establishing what it became so Basically, while this new studio was under production, Ince moved a large troop from Oklahoma to California, which consisted of 300 cowboys and cowgirls, 600 horses and other livestock, and a whole Swee tribe. They were renamed the Bison 101 Ranch Company and specialized in making Western pictures. The complete, completed studio was, fil was filled with streets lined with houses, mansions, and everything in between. The extensive Western sets were built outdoors and used on the site for years. As described by Catherine LaHue, Ince invested $35,000 in buildings, stages, and sets, a bit of Switzerland, a Puritan settlement, a Japanese village, beyond the breakers, an ancient brigantine weighed anchor, cutlassed men swarming over the sides of the ship, while on the shore performing cowboys galloped about, twirling their lassos in pursuit of errant cattle. The main herds were kept in the hills, where Ince also raised feed and garden produce, supplies of every sort we needed. Were needed to the house and fed the ve veritable army of actors directors and subordinates so it really was a tiny city sort of like disney is now yeah. and most you know? of the studios back then they were they were their own entity even to the extent of even like the disney company and everything mm -hmm. they had their own housing networks they had their own food everything was completely in-house and that's why it was a contractual agreement because when you're committing to this the studio really wanted to make sure that you stayed with them. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, they, they actually brought in everybody and made a family unit out of it. So Inceville was large enough that many of the cowboys, Native Americans, and working crew lived on site. Other actors would commute in via the red trolley cars to the Long Wharf in Temescal Canyon. Temescal Canyon. Temescal Canyon. Mm -hmm. 
Ince's house overlooked the vast studio. He was the central authority over multiple production units and slowly began revolutionizing the film production process. His studio is considered by many to be the prototype for how Hollywood would eventually function, with the various members of the team working together under one organized unit rather than segmented. Before this time, the director, cameraman, controlled film production, but Ince changed that role to one of the producers, who became responsible for the film from inception to final project. He revolutionized and defined that producer's role in both creative side and production side. His was also the first studio to hire a separate screenwriter, director, and editor instead of the director handling all these responsibilities. By 1913, the role of production manager had also been created. Seven, the separation of these roles allowed for the studio to operate more efficiently and produce more content at greater speeds. The output, the output at this time was increased from one two reel picture per week to three. Contrary to films today, these finalized pieces went from writing to final cut within one week. This decentralization process that was created by Ince allowed the studios to meet the growing demand from theater growers. The closest analogy could, could be that Ince created the Hollywood assembly line of movie production. Between 1930 and 1918, Ince exercised more control over film production processes. In 1913, he was responsible for 150 two-reel films, mostly westerns, which were increasing in popularity of the f due to the fact that he was uh, making so many. Mm -hmm. That was the main thing that was in theater, so that was what was popular, and the demand kept growing. Yeah. It was during this time, however, that Ince released a five-reel film called The Battle of Gettysburg, which brought into vogue the feature-length film. These, like, two-reel real films they were super short back then yeah. like they were teeny tiny films yeah, it was 15 minutes each reel so five reels getting into that whole feature length thing and that was Ince's innovation at the time three of Ince's most important films during this time were war on the plains in 1912 custard's last fight also in 1912 and the italian in 1915 which depicted Im immigrant life in manhattan which would have been really really salient to that time of immigrant population That's, coming in the italian is a beautiful it's actually really well and you actually see the cinematography being created for the first time where the camera isn't just static it's actually in motion which was very interesting because these cameras were 200 to, to 600 pound monstrosities mm -hmm. that were the size of cars modern cars right so actually custard's last fight featured many of the native americans who were actually in the battle Wow. That's pretty nifty, right? Yeah. So he was an innovator, definitely, during his time. Definitely. But in 1913, Ince moved from full-time directing to producing. I think he really pioneered the producer role in what it is. Yeah. You know, more of that overseeing everything rather than one niche area. Which was always my fascination, honestly, mm -hmm. when it came to, to film production and all that. My, my favorite part was production management and producing. So he transitioned his role as director at a studio to up-and-coming directors of the time, including Francis Ford, John Ford, Jack Conway, William Desmond Taylor, Reginald Barker, Fred Noble, Henry King, and Frank Borzage. Mm -hmm. The success of Ince's studio could be attributed not only to the assembly line production, but also the masterful editing Ince required as well. According to David Shepard, who is a film preservationist, he did everything. He was so proficient at every aspect of filmmaking that even films he didn't direct have the ince print because he exercised such tight control over his scripts and edited so mercilessly that he could delegate direction to others and still get what he wanted. Much of what ince contributed to the American film took place off the screen. He established production conventions that persisted forebears and through his career, and film lasted and though his career in film only lasted 14 years his influence far outlived him so yeah i definitely agree with that because he he did he is a legend and honestly if it wasn't for his structures we wouldn't have the modern filmmaking studios that we have now mm -hmm. and the the innovations that they created because of how many films they produced right in 1916 however a film a fire broke out in insville it was the first of many which would eventually destroy all the buildings. Luckily, however, Ince had recently opened another studio named Co uh, Culver, Culver City. Ince ended 
of selling and destroying Entville to actor William S. Hart, whom he had featured in many of his earlier westerns until a rift had developed between the two over the sharing of the profits. Hart renamed the studio Hartville, but sold it in 1919 to Robert Cole Pictures Company, which worked on the site until 1922. The last remnants of Innsville were destroyed in another fire in July 4th, 1922, leaving the site much like a ghost town. The Culver City studio, which Ince had relocated to just before the fires, was, was the brainchild of real estate mogul Harvey Culver, who had noticed Ince while he was filming on location in Bologna Creek. Culver convinced Ince to relocate to Culver City and set up operations there. Again, Ince being the forward-thinking man that he was, finally broke his ties with BWMP and partnered with D.W. Griffith and Max Sennett, Sennett to form the Triage Motion Picture Triangle. Triangle Motion Picture Company. The studio was named Triangle because from an aerial point of view, the property was like a triangle shape. The studio was built on Washington Boulevard, which would one day be the site of lot one of the well-known picture company MGM Studios. Triangle was considered one of the most dynamic studios in Hollywood at the time and attracted several A-list directors and stars to work there, including Lillian Gish, Roscoe Fatty Arbuckle, and Douglas Fairbanks Sr. They were also responsible for producing some of the most beloved films of their time, including the Keystone Cops comedy franchise. <laughs> Ince is credited as, as, the, as a director at Triangle, however, he only supervised the production of most pictures, often acting as an executive producer. One of the most important pictures he made was in 1916 called Civilization, which was a plea for peace and American neutrality in a mythical country and was dedicated to the mothers of soldiers who died in World War I. During his time at Triangle, Ince added several stages and an administrative building, but by 1918 he had sold his shares of the studio to Griffith and Senate. Three years later, the studio was acquired by Goldwyn Pictures and in 1924 became known as Metro Golden, Goldwyn Mayer Studios. MGM. This is the film company responsible for movies like Gone with the Wind, King Kong, and Citizen Kane. After leaving Triangle, Ince worked with Adolf Zucker to form Paramount Artcraft Pictures, which would later be known as Paramount Pictures. But by late 1819, 1918, 1918 <laughs> Ince wanted to run his own studio again. He purchased a lot on Washington Boulevard from Culver and formed the Thomas H. Ince Studio, which operated until 1924. Ince wanted this studio to be different than any other studio existed during that time. The studio was designed with a mansion administrative building, modeled after George Washington's home in Mount Vernon. The 40 office buildings on the lot were all built in a colonial revival style. The lot also was filled with bungalows of various movie stars, former various movie stars who would be working there. By 1920, the lot also included two glass stages, a hospital, fire department, reservoir slash swimming pool, and expansive back lot. The studio was so impressive that it attracted vis visitors like the King and Queen of Belgium and President Woodrow Wilson. Ince managed a team of eight directors but retained creative control over all of his films. Ince also moved away from only making westerns and started including social dramas as well. But it was during this time Ince also started to decline in terms of power and influence in, in Hollywood as more studios came to the forefront. The studio system was beginning to take over in Hollywood and independent filmmakers like Ince were slowly being muscled out. In 1924, Ince was negotiating a deal with media tycoon William Randolph Hearst. Hearst's Cosmopolitan Productions would begin using Ince's studios, and this would have been a huge lift for the failing Ince within the film industry as Hearst was a major player in radio, newspaper, and now film production. After a weekend visit to Ince's home to negotiate the contract details, Hearst invited Ince out for a weekend party on his yacht. They would finalize the deal and celebrate Ince's upcoming birthday as well. Ince took a train to San Diego where he joined his other guests on the yacht the next day. The party on Sunday night 
To celebrate Ince's birthday was a lively affair, but Ince had a case of indigestion due to the salted almonds and champagne he consumed that night. Ince had suffered from a peptic ulcer, ulcers and was sensitive to many foods. At this point in the story, there are many versions of what exactly happened that night. According to Dr. Goodman, who was a licensed but not practicing, practicing uh, physician during that time, Ince was taken by train to Del Mar, where he was treated at a hospital for his ailment. Ince asked for his wife to, to join and asked personal actor Dr. Uh, Dr. Ada Kuhn? Count Cone? Glasgow. Glasgow. Ince's son joined his mother from the, the troop. The group brought Ince back home where he ended up dying. According to Ince's wife, Mel, Ince had been treated for chest pains caused by angina, but his son, who later became a physician, insists that his father's illness was more closely resembling a thrombosis. Dr. Glasgow signed a death certificate, which cited heart failure as the cause of death. Ince was just 44 years old at the time. So this is important because this is the official version of the story, that he had indigestion at the party, was taken to the hospital, and died as a result. That's the official version that went on his death certificate. But the mystery that comes in from this um, actually started when the Los Angeles Times released a story right after his death, movie producer shot on Hearst Yacht. Now, this was the time of journalism going crazy. There wasn't a whole lot of fact checking. They would just print it and go. Not that that's much different today, but there's even less, less ability to cover things. So what's really cool about it though, is the fact that that night, the story completely disappeared from the paper and his obituary in the same paper listed that he died um, of heart disease. And you got to think Hearst at this time was a huge, he had a lot of power. He could mm -hmm. make things die really quickly. So the fact that the story came out and then was pulled by a competing paper says a lot. People were like, well, what's up with this? Why is this happening? So a month after his death, the New York Times reported the San Diego district attorney said that he died of heart failure and there'd be no additional investigation. And Ince was actually cremated immediately following after his death per his wishes, and his wife left the country for Europe about seven months later. The controversy of this and the rumors that her shot Ince came from the idea that he mistook him for actually Charlie Chaplin on the yacht who he thought was having an affair with his mistress, Marion Davies. They were very close friends, and a lot of papers reported the fact that they would go out to dinners and that Charlie was enamored with Marion. It was very well known that Charlie was a player, mm -hmm. and he hooked up with a lot of women during that time. So in this version of the story, Marion was sitting with Ince, and Hearst thought that it was Charlie Chaplin, and he shot him in the head, is the theory behind this. And it actually came from Charlie Chaplin's valet. And his name was, I'm going to butcher this, Torechi Kono, because he saw Ince being taken out of the yacht to be transported to the hospital, and he said he was bleeding from the head, and he told his wife that, and his wife spread the story around to all the other people that she worked with during that time. Hmm. And then these, there was another actress on board. Her name was Ele Eleanor Glynn, and she told a fellow actress that everyone who had been on the yacht that night was sworn to secrecy about everything that happened. So that was kind of where that came from. And the final piece that makes it very sketch is the fact that Luella Parsons was given a lifetime contract by Hearst. She was on the boat as well. She was given a lifetime contract right after all this happened. Wow, that's incredible. And um, movie gossip con colonist also was also allegedly aboard the yacht that that's day. That's Luella, yep. Oh, okay. Look in there. A uh, final confusing piece of the puzzle was that Hearst provided Mel with a trust fund before she left for Europe, and it was rumored that he paid off Ince's mortgage on his apartment building in New York. However, Nell was left with extreme wealth, and the apartment was already owned at that time. When asked about the rumors regarding his involvement in Ince's death, Hearst replied, Not only am I innocent on this, of this Ince murder, but he also said, so is everybody else. According to the reports later on, Nell Ince also became frustrated from, with, with the continued rumors regarding her husband's death, saying, do you think I would have done nothing if I ever suspected that my husband had been a victim of foul play on anyone's part? 
So contrary to all the rumors, Inns did have an open casket viewing prior to being cremated, and no one noted any type of bullet wound to his head. He was cremated on the 21st, and remember his birthday was on the 16th, that was five days later, and his ashes were spread to sea by his family. His final film, Enticement, which was a romance set in the French Alps, was released posthumously in 1925. Hmm. So the reason there's a lot of intrigue around this, I think, is because it's Hearst. And Hearst had a reputation for, like I said, making stories go away that he didn't like. He did not like unfavorable press during that time. And he was dealing with the scandal of having a long-term affair. And yeah. he was not divorced because his wife wanted to remain a wealthy woman who was married. She didn't believe in divorce. But she was fine with the arrangement with Marion. So he had a very public affair. you know. And he was very, But he was an older man. Marion was in her 20s at the time. And he was very jealous of Charlie and their friendship. So there was a lot of dynamic going on here. And actually, I believe it was her granddaughter who originally wrote the book Murder at San Simeon, or I forget what the exact title is, about the story. Hmm. And uh, then a, a director actually wrote, uh, made a movie off of it called The Cat's Meow. Yes, and then also the other story that it comes straight from Hearst's, or is based off of Hearst's character and Hearst's life, is Citizen's Kane, Citizen Kane. So if Orson you, Orson Welles, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And Orson Welles was a huge fan of Ince, which I found out later on, and and he just, really hated. He really William hated Randolph Hearst, Hearst which yeah. you can see in the movie, and Hearst really tried to bury that movie because he knew it was about him. He knew it was backhanded slap. He knew it was Marion was featured in it. So it's and it was it was also on. a lot of mostly it was the East Coast versus the West Coast but that that movie's perfect example of his power. The movie almost didn't get made because they didn't want to touch the Hearst machine. He was huge, but he was in everything. New York huge. Yeah, and he was trying to move out to the West. I exactly. mean, I think especially with his relationship with Marion because she lived on the West Coast with Hollywood and all that. So exactly. So that that was it was a revolution that occurred in the from the the East Coast, which was interesting in itself because it created the first time where you actually saw a coastal war mm -hmm. be brewing not in an in a, what do you call it entertainment industry mm -hmm. which later on happened again in the 90s as well and that i think that's very fascinating because you saw that culture kind of develop over 100 years basically right well you know and when i actually started researching this case i was more interested in the rumors about his murder i thought that'd be fascinating but just learning about his life and everything he did and how he still you can still see his impact on film even today yeah. 100 years later i found that actually more interesting the rumors about his death you know they're interesting there's a lot of intrigue behind them but i think just an ode to his life and what he did because like i said he's a forgotten figure and he really is a except, forgotten except figure. except by movie buffs movie buffs know thomas Ince, but for the most part people they don't think about that even in uh, movie buffs there were not taught i i went to film school my personally and i took film history and everything and that Ince is not included in any of that and he really needs to be i think it's because he was so niche and because he had such a decline and he was independent rather than the big movies. And exactly. what came out of that time was MGM. You know, you think Sunset Boulevard, you think Paramount Pictures. They get all exactly. the credit for what Hollywood became. You don't think about the small thing that it was built on. You don't even and like the... Um, there are a couple of the studios today that are remnants. Independent artists, that's still a studio. Or at least it was for a bit. And that was formed mm -hmm. by like Charlie Chaplin and actors, Douglas Fairbanks at that time. So you can still see some of those, the residual of that that Hollywood United that Hollywood artists, machine yeah. yes you know, yeah United Artists but you see the the little remnants of what Hollywood used to be when mm -hmm. actors had much more control over the production process and all that and they had a lot more influence that was going on because it was a different world and also this was it was the same thing in Sen and uh, Charlie Chaplin had a relationship Charlie Chaplin took that same idea that Ince was working mm -hmm. on and progressed it because if it wasn't for Charlie Chaplin's production company mm -hmm. We wouldn't have so many famous artists. Woody Allen came out of there, which is another but fascinating But if you think about story. Ince, Ince is a like, perfect example of someone who saw the problems with the system. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, if he hadn't been there, do you think Hollywood would have progressed the same way? I think it would Because I think a lot different. of big studios did steal his ideas. They stole, he, think about all he was involved with. He was involved with like MGM. He was involved with what became Paramount Pictures. Like He was a big, big player, and he gets no credit. And Biograph. And Biograph it's really, was really sad thing. and Biograph and that was uh, that was both coasts he like went both coasts and revolutionized it and it was really based on his own ingenuity and ambition which I think is really cool he's really a rags to riches story yeah. and it's really sad that that's how his life ended and he died so young 44 I know exactly he, you know wonder what he would have done if he had been able to live out his full life I I don't know if I buy into the indigestion leading to heart failure I think it's just kind of something happened 
but yeah. I mean, who's going to know what? But I don't believe in it. It was indigestion. Can you imagine being taken Even down by salted just, almonds? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's how you end. I'm sorry, I shouldn't laugh, but I mean, come on. Salted almonds brings you down. And I think, honestly, at that time, you're talking about this was also during the heroin epidemic, mm -hmm. which was a huge thing, and that you lose control when, you, when you're when you hopped up on heroin. Yeah. And it, it's... Different world. Yeah, exactly. Hollywood machine. Definitely Hollywood, and it's basic but there was a lot especially going with prohibition it was a time of a, mm -hmm. like a lack of self-control and especially if he was out on a yacht that means he went out to international waters where they can't stop him from doing anything so interesting story interesting yeah. case definitely thank definitely. you for joining me tonight oh thank you for having me